Hey YouTube, welcome back to the Blaze to Be Shop and another project video. We're going to continue on working on this Pearson pallet system. I know the last video I put out was on a Pearson pallet. This one, I'm going to try not to duplicate some content, but I'm telling you what, there is so much to learn, at least for me to learn, on uh, how to build these pallets and then how to actually put the pallets into use. So kind of do a speed go through and just talk through some of the different design principles in this pallet today. Pretty quick go through, have a machine that and get that one ready. And then we're gonna actually put the pallet into use. We're gonna go ahead and machine some parts on this pallet and machine some parts on that last pallet we made and talk through a little bit of what I had to learn in Fusion in order to build my stock, build the stock material around that to be able to have six, eight, however many pieces on a pallet and have the individual stock around them as well. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking through the Fusion learning, get these pallets done, and then ultimately we're gonna go through, talk about the time saved and what I was doing for time machining these parts one at a time and how much time I've saved by putting these on the pallet. So a lot going on in this video today. Uh, hopefully you get something out of it and you enjoy it. If you're new to the channel, I sure appreciate you finding this Blades to Be channel. I encourage you to check out some of the other videos on here on machining, welding, knife making, just everything else going on here in the Blades to Be shop. If you like what you see, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. And if you like this video, I'd love to hear from you a comment or a like on it as well. For those of you already subscribed to the channel, really appreciate you coming back and watching these. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at what we're doing here today. We're gonna to go up to the computer first, talk through the design on this new pallet, and then we're gonna come down here, start making some chips. Let's go take a look in Fusion. We just made a pallet in the video last week, so I'm not looking to duplicate a lot of content here. You can check that one out. I'm gonna focus this on what I learned and how I tried to make this pallet better, make it machine a little bit faster. First thing I learned is I need to stay away from this middle section right here and stay away from the lock rings that hold the pallet onto the Pearson Pro Pallet system. So my original plan was I was gonna leave that as a space in between, put my four blanks up on this side, four down on this side, and try to use the center section for my Mighty Bike clamps, kind of like how I used them on the end of the last pallet. Just really wasn't happy with that. It was only going to be able to get two clamps on there, and using the formula that Pearson recommends, take the width of your clamp, multiply that by three, and that's how often you want to have a clamp. So for a three-quarter inch clamp, that means you want to have a clamp every two and a quarter inches. I've got a five-inch piece, so ideally, I think I should have more than two clamps on there. I wanted to get to three. This wasn't going to work for me, so I came up with a different Different design and this is what I ended up with. I finally realized that if I don't try putting clamps in the middle of the pallet then I can stay away from the zone that I need to stay away from and I put my pieces back to back in there. Don't end up with any white space. Was able to still get my eight parts on here and I've got three clamps going on each one of them. Able to get in between to do the machining on this radius right here that I need to so I can get between my blades. Good clamping power. I think this is going to be a good pallet design. This is what I went ahead and finished up. So let's take a look at how we're going to go and machine this. Again, looks a lot like how we did the last one one except I got rid of all of the spiral down to start cutting and hopefully that will speed things up considerably. Not exactly sure how I got rid of it. I'm not sure what I changed in a step over, a step down, because right now this is set on zigzag, but even if I go set it back to helical, it just doesn't want a helical in there. So I've done something in the settings that changed it. On this half inch cutter, it's almost a little aggressive as it plunges down into the aluminum, but it's aluminum. I think we're gonna get away with it. It's gonna be fine. We're gonna get rid of that material. Then we're gonna go to our 3 8 cutter and pretty similar how I roughed these out. Again, it's not plunging down. That half inch cutter doesn't take out the very corner and it leaves some little steps on the side. So I do need to make sure I start at the top. But then when I get to the quarter inch, the other thing I did to get rid of the spiral downs is I set it so that I do these four pockets as one machining operation, and then we do all the deeper pockets as a separate machining operation. Same thing, it's just gonna plunge straight down. It's gonna go through that last 25 thou worth of material and should cut considerably quicker on these. After that, we're gonna drill it out, tap it. I've ground off the tap since last week since I used it for hand tapping into the bottom of these holes, and I also set it for 50 thou deeper. So we should tap considerably more threads in here using the machine and have a lot less to go hand tap after. And ideally, I get it, I should have a spiral point tap and you can buy spiral point taps uh, in this helicoil tap size. 
It just why do the extra cost? I'm not going to use it that often. If it was a production part making hundreds of them, I would definitely invest in a better tap to do that. And finally, I did remember to put the bevel on here. So instead of using the hand deburring tool on these, we're going to go ahead and cut a little 10 thou bevel on there to clean this up. Should end up with a nicer looking palette overall. That's what the cam's going to look like. And ideally, we're going to go ahead and show the cam for finishing the blanks on here. So we're going to come back up and take a look at actually setting the cam up on these. And then we're going to put this palette into operation before we wrap up this video this week. Stay tuned. Let's head down to the Tormach and let's start making some chips. All right, we've seen what we're going to cut from the computer. So we've got our fresh palette loaded in there. Should go a little faster this time with the speeds and feeds I've got set up. And we've got our tools loaded up this time. So we've got our 44, 43, 42, our 83 and our 84. And then I've got number 12. We're gonna go ahead and put a chamfer on this one. So we've got that all set up. And we've got our program all loaded in here. And you can see that we're set up on G59.3. So we should have a good program. Let's go ahead and run this and see how she turns out. clearly a little more aggressive machining than the last pallet I made. It was actually closer to the 10 minute mark on the uh, machining time there. I waited for the compressor to stop before I started recording. So we got that done. And here's what that's looking like. We got that roughed out with that half inch end mill. We should have 25 thou axial and radial to take off. We're gonna go cut those pockets now with the 3 8 That should ramp in there a little quicker as well, but this will be our longest cycle. And then we'll come back and run that quarter inch around there and finish it off. All right. So I clearly could have picked up the pace on these pocket machining a little bit more. I think this is my slowest stop, but it's kind of weird the way it roughed it out. It didn't take all the material all the way out to the edge. So I think the rough down all the way from the top of the part just to get rid of some material. Anyway, still working on cleaning up those tool paths, but this is definitely faster than the last one we made. So we'll just keep knocking these out. We've got six of 24 done little ways to go to get all these pockets in there. All right, well, that was long and painful. We're at 51 minutes now, but we do have some nice pockets cut in there. I clearly needed to speed up the ramp feed rate and everything on those. It wasn't getting too crazy with the cutting, so could have sped that up a little bit. We'll do that for next time. Now we're going to get in there with that quarter inch. It's only going to take 20 minutes for it to go in there and finish all these pockets. Definitely saving some time on this quarter inch one without all the spiral downs. Not really sure what I did in Fusion to get rid of all those. Just uh, changed a couple parameters, but it's not really doing spiral downs on anything. It's dropping right down where I want it to. So should go pretty quick. Yes. 
Yeah, we're definitely cutting a little bit faster this time around. We got that quarter inch end mill. This is just finishing up this pocket now, so it's taking the edge and the bottom at the same time. Gonna come in here and hit that corner, dig that out. And then it'll just finish up the rest of the way around and we'll move on to the next pocket. And not spiraling down into those cuts just saves a ton of time. Working well. pockets it looks like I got right with the finish cut. That's getting right down in there. Knocking those out in no time. Yeah, I would say just roughing those out needs some work, but the rest of this program was not too bad. We're getting down here in these holes that are full of chips now from all the other cutting. And it's still doing a pretty good job of blasting that out to get started in there. Move on to this hole, which is damn full. There's them out pretty nice. And again, this hole full. Ah, the coolant pump works pretty decent on this. I think a lot of people upgrade and put in a more powerful one, but so far I've been having pretty good luck with this stuff. With just the stock one. Alright, up to hour 17 minutes. Again, a little extra stop times in between as I'm cleaning up and waiting on the compressor. But we're finished, so the next two steps should go pretty quick. We're going to drill, get in there and tap, and then just run the chamfer around these big openings and clean those up. It'll be about 15 minutes total machining time left to go. I don't even think that much. We'll knock it out. Drilling in there works quite well. All right, with that tap ground off, and I added an extra 50 thou to the depth, so we are definitely tapping a lot deeper this time than on that last pallet. Should save a significant amount of hand tapping as we get in there to finish those holes out to depth. Not much to look at. We're just going to roll right from that rigid tapping into that chamfer tool. Should just do a nice little clean up on the edge of the machine. Just taking a skim off of there to break that edge. Rolling along at 35 inches per minute on this one. Oh, 
think I slowed it down in the corners on this one. Probably should have done that on those inside ones. All right, even going to go into that little Mickey Mouse here. Chamfer in that. It's hitting those other corners a little bit heavier because since I just used a quarter inch end mill down there, it didn't get a sharp corner. So, cutting a little bit more off of it. Still working all right. Well, there we go. Even with all our stops and breaks and filming our 33 minutes, we've got this pallet done, except for a little bit of hand work. And we've got that drill tapped. We chamfered it this time, which we didn't do the last time. So we've got a little bit better pallet going on here. And I think that ran pretty decent. I'm gonna go ahead and actually do a couple of quick measurements. Didn't do that on the last one. So let's do a couple of measurements across here and see how accurate our pallet is. All right, let's go ahead and check our accuracy. We should be 390 here. I'm getting 390, 389.5, should be 385 here, 385.5, 390 again in the middle, all right, 390 and a half, 385 again on this one, there's 385, and then 390 again on the back. And I'm getting about 391.5. Again, this is an unfinished piece, so not too bad. 9545, 9555, so about a thou difference there. Here, actually, for depth, we'll get a depth gauge on there. And I'm coming in at 151.5. 151.5 and our pockets here should be 280 those I'm coming in right at 280 about 280 and a half over there about 280 and a half. So on this other depth, off about a thou, thou and a half. Again, when I machined these, I was facing these off. You know, that face mill was coming in about a thou different, so not surprised about that. But my depth on the pocket seems to be within about half a thou. Good measurement across those ribs, what I expected to see there. So accuracy, I would say, is definitely within what I am needing for these knives. So happy with the accuracy on that all around. We also tapped in there a lot more than one or two threads this time. So it should be pretty quick work to get in there and finish hand tapping those holes and get our helicoils dropped in there. First, just going to clean up a little bit of chips, do a little bit of quick cleanup, and then we'll come back and finish up this pallet. All right, let's get these things tapped, helicoiled, and get our Mighty Bites in there. All right, we did our rigid tapping a lot deeper in the holes on this pallet, and it made the hand tapping go so much faster and easier. Only had to go about a quarter of an inch in there. We got this first hole done, and we're going to skip through all the boring part, jump right in here to the last hole, get that last hole tapped down the rest of the way, and then we're gonna be ready to put some helicoils in this pallet and get it ready for use. For the most part, putting the helicoils in went really smooth. The nice thing about that Tormach and rigid tapping is it's timed. It actually starts tapping all those holes in the exact same spot. So once you kind of figure out where that is, makes it pretty easy to start the helicoils. Uh, I did, however, manage to mess this one up, so. I got it started, I got it a little bit crooked and put a little bit too much pressure on it. So even though I got it lined up a second later, I got it about halfway in the hole. And because I'd put a little extra pressure on the tab, the tab broke off on me about halfway down. The nice thing about helicoils, as long as you can get a hold of the very end of it, you can go ahead and just kind of unwind it and pull it back out. So I used the tool a little bit to start 
unwinding it and I got it most of the way out of there. You can see kind of going around in a circle to get it out. And once I got it as far as I could, didn't want to ruin my install tool. So I went and grabbed some needle nose pliers and same thing, just kind of wind it around in a circle, pull, pull the whole helicoil out and just touched it up with a tap. Make sure I hadn't messed anything up in there. Make sure the hole was still good and clean. Grab another helicoil and put it in there. So same thing, we'll sort of skip the boring parts. We'll get this helicoil in and uh, we'll jump ahead and show getting the last one in and then we're gonna be pretty much ready to get this pallet into operation. Let's take a look at our finished product here. Well, there it is, another pallet complete. A couple pieces in there, plenty of room to come down and machine that radius and that little taper on the end and then drill, cut the half moon, ream, all the stuff that we need to do there. Well, we made a quick job of making this pallet this week, so we don't repeat too much from last week. Stay tuned, now we're gonna actually use this, and we're gonna go ahead and cut some blades out. Let's go check out the cam on this back up at the computer, see what we got set up, and we'll come down here and get some cut. Well, it turns out that making these pallets, that's only part of the fun of learning how to understand and how to work with pallets. So once I got in there and actually wanted to put my parts in place, a little bit of extra learning went on as well. As you can see, I've got these set up on here. And in the case of these blade blanks, I'm actually not machining anything off the top or the bottom. So using a joint to lock these directly onto the pallet did actually work out. That did put it in the right place for me. I'll talk a little bit about my other key learning point about the joints and how you set your pieces on the pallet when we go look at the other two. But for this one, it was pretty straightforward. However, once I created it, if I had gone in here to the stock, if I had done my usual, which is from a relative sized box and built the material all around it, then what I found is it just built the stock all the way across the middle, which wouldn't be too bad, I guess, but I really wanted to understand where I was just taking some material off. So I wanted to have the stock be an accurate representation of the model. So what I found is I wanted to actually machine from a solid and in order to do that you have to go and create your solid so let's cancel out of that so I went in here to my actual model and if I go in here and look at one of these blade pieces under the bodies I now have the blade and then I have the stock material which you can see right there designed around it kind of a detailed process but I did put together a whole nother fusion flicker video specifically in how to create your stock around your part and then how to go ahead and drop those onto the palette and set those in place and how to use patterns. So there's another video out there. I'll link to that up here in the corner of the screen so you'll have access to get to that one. But the bottom line is if you want your stock material to be accurately represented on the palette, then you need to go in there and create your stock separate. And especially when I go look at the other two palettes and you'll see that I need the stock to be positioned correctly in order to function correctly with that single point of origin, really became important that I had to create the stock around it and not try to machine from a relative size box. Now, if you're going to think of these like a vise, and if you're going to probe your part, maybe probe into the corner of your palette and probe your Z off of the top of this, then using a relative size box, you would still be able to do that as normal. But part of the great functionality of these palettes is to be able to use a single point of origin. And if you're going to do that, you need to make sure that your Z height is accurately reflected. So if you have stock on the bottom of your part, on the top of your part, again, you've got to set that properly. So we'll look at that in a moment, but here's what we're going to go do to machine this first set of blades. So I've got eight of these dropped on the pallet. We're gonna go in and do this contour and cut around the end point on the blade. That radius around the end is important. That's where it matches up with the end of my frame. And then we're gonna go in there and just do some marking center drill holes to get those positioned. Drill the holes in there around that crescent. Get in there and bore the hole in the blade. And then we're gonna cut the pockets. We're gonna cut around that crescent. I had an interesting, uh, the computer, it was doing something weird. That's why I did those as two different operations. And then I'm also gonna get in there and ream out that pivot pin hole, go in there and then drill and ream the last hole on the blade. Now for these, because it was a mirror image this way and then another cascade, a pattern down and then a mirror image for the other four, I just went ahead, I did not use the pattern process for these ones. I just actually selected all of the parts that I needed to to machine. It wasn't that complicated for the cam to select everything. So that's how I went ahead and did it for this particular setup. And then I only have 12 blades to do. So I've got one post process for all eight blades. And then I post pop processed and I set it up so that I just had to do four. And if I started with my eight, I duplicated this setup. And then I went in here and I just edited each of these and I deleted the ops or deleted the parts that I didn't want to do went really fast. It maybe took me five, 10 minutes most to create this where I only did four. So pretty quick and simple. 
We get to these inside, and this is where it really became important to create the stock around my material. If I went in there and if I did a relative size box, and if I did a joint and I connected my piece directly onto the pallet, which is what I initially did, thinking that was gonna work, then when I did the relative size box and I wanted 10 thou below and 10 thou above, it was pushing the stock down into my pallet because the joint was off of my design piece. So it wasn't holding my design 10 thou up off the pallet to uh, be able to go in there and do the first side and then flip it over. So that's where it became really important to make sure that this stock was built around my design and then I could set my joints up off of this stock and lock those in place. So again, I've got a whole nother video out there 20 minutes or so just to go through and explain that, building your stock around it and using the joints to lock it in place correctly. So I'll let you go out there and watch that one. But for this one, I did go through and set up the machining. So I faced it. And again, these are a mirror image. So I set up my cam across these two parts right here. So it faces across. We're gonna go in there, drill some holes, drill some more holes, drill a couple more holes, and then we're gonna bore out the middle get in there and ream that, do just this little counter bore for that, uh, the washer to go on there. And then we're going to cut around the profile so that when I set it down uh, from the other side, we'll be able to finish that and it will already be beveled. That's really the main thing is I didn't wanna have to go set this up again to bevel it so or chamfer it. So we cut around the profile and then I cut the chamfer on there and then we're done. So then this side is finished for those two. And then I went in there and I did the pattern. So after I machined it on the top, it's really easy and you can even edit the pattern, but it's a linear. Just have to know my spacing for how far down it is on this pallet. It's 3.185 inches. Once I have the cam set up, cascaded that pattern down, and that's where it's going to cut all six of those for us. And then after we're done, we're going to use the same pallet, but because I have it uh, locked on a the stock is a little bit different and I have it locked in a different place. I've got another uh, design for this infusion. Again, I've got the stock built around it. At this point now, the stock, it doesn't have any material down below, so it's zero. So I could technically lock the piece right onto the pallet for this one, but I've got 10 thou of stock up above and I just uh, using joints again to put these in the pallet in the right place so they get locked in there correctly. And for this one, very similar, we're gonna face it off on top, we're gonna counter bore, and then we're going to machine this pocket in here, go counter bore all those other drilled holes for the screws to drop into, and we're gonna get in there and do a little 1 8 pocket in there, and then drill these small 256 tap drill holes, so we'll get around there and drill those, or I guess that's the center drill piece of it, and then drilling those tap drill holes. Not really complex operations, got all that cam created in there. And then same thing, I just took all of it and did a pattern. And once you have all the cam done, you can see this in more detail in the other video, but it's as simple as you highlight everything that you've done, you just right click and you put add to a new pattern and that's where it's gonna open up your pattern piece. And just like before, linear, move that straight down. You could also, I could have done one of these if the part I was doing was the same for all six, which is what you'll see in that other video, then I can pattern it across once and then I can go a second direction and I can bring it down. So I could just do cam on this one piece and pattern out the rest of it. A couple key points in learning. The main thing was took me a little bit to figure out how to design my stock around the part, make sure I'm locking my pieces onto the pallet in the right way so that if there's supposed to be stock on the bottom, I'm holding it up off the pallet. And all of that is because using that single point of origin, I'm not probing on the top. So just change my way of thinking a little bit from doing these one at a time in a vise, but great power in it. And uh, I'm looking forward to get down to the machine and go ahead and try these out now and cut them. I think we've got these cammed correctly using these pallets to the fullest of their ability. Let's head back down and let's go uh, stop making pallets and let's start making parts on them instead. Let's go make some chips. All right, so before I can put these blade blanks into that new pallet that we just made, I just need to trim the ends of these down to four and three quarter. So I'm back to my vise, got that vise on the pallet. So drop that in there back to just a G54. So I probed that in out here on the edge. I just use a piece of high speed steel to set that in there and uh, make sure I can get that repeatability instead of a vice stop. That's close enough for trimming these ends and it's just gonna make them exactly four and three quarters. So we'll knock all 12 of these out and then we're gonna go ahead and load up our pallet and try this out. Pretty nice being able to just drop that vice on there though and not have to tram that in. So it makes for a pretty quick changeover. Quick buzz down one side. Quick buzz down the other. Now 
that's it. Well, here it is, the moment of truth. We've got our blade blanks completely finished. We've got these all trimmed down to size. Now it's time to get these loaded on here and actually get in there. And for these ones with the stock height, as I said, the, the stock height, I'm not actually taking anything off the top or the bottom. So no big deal building the stock around these ones. When we get to the other one, it was definitely really, really critical that uh, you know I built the stock around them to let it know exactly where those sat on the pallet. But for these, we're just going to slide them in here and get them torqued down. So the torque specs on these is either 175 inch pounds or 14 and a half foot pounds. So I've got a torque wrench here, reads in inch pounds. So I've got that set up to 175. So we'll make sure we get these torqued in place. Uh, but first, I'm just going to get them snugged up to the edge and make sure that they are, are good that way. This was the one when I was trimming the ends came up, I don't know if I just, if it moved on me when I was setting it in the vise, but somehow I didn't have enough material, so it didn't take a good cut off of this end. It's just a little bit shorter than the other one, so I'm actually gonna put a 5 thou feeler gauge on the back of this one to make sure that I get it positioned where I want it. Uh, when I go to finish the blade, I can get rid of a little bit off of the tip and that'll be fine. So I'll put a feeler gauge in on that one. The rest of these, we should be all good. Gonna go ahead and orient that now so that I don't lose track of which side needs to go over there. Next, I'm gonna go put this in the machine. I think it'll be a lot easier to hold that in there while I torque it. So let's go get this set in place. All right, we got the pallet all loaded in there, torqued, ready to go. All right, I pulled my vise off of here, so right now I'm still set up on G54. I am gonna go ahead and grab my file though. So here's eight blades on a Pearson pallet. So I've got my file, but I need to set this back to G59.3. And now we should be set up to 59.3. We're at G59.3. We're set up to run a pallet. I don't need to go in and probe anything. I haven't moved anything on my pallet system. I know I do need to set up some tools. So actually I just thought of that. I may have to pull that pallet back off of there to be able to access my G55, put my tool setter in there. So let me go ahead and do that. I'm gonna get all my tools loaded and then we will be ready to come back here and cut this pallet and we'll start making these eight pieces right here on the end of these blades so let me get some tools set up and we'll make some chips all right we got our pallet locked and loaded we've got all our tools locked and loaded and i just realized though i'm still on g55 from setting my tools let me fix that real quick we need g59.3 enter all right we're on g59.3 we've got our tools all set up in there this program is going to run 59.3 and i actually just thought about something i can run eight or four at a time since it's a new program and i've got to run four anyway i'm gonna just run four this time around we'll just leave the other four on the pallet and we'll just run those the next time so this time we're only going to be doing the top four on here and then we'll swap those out and we'll run all eight next time. So we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and hit this go button and see how she cuts. First time cutting on a Pearson Pro pallet. Pretty much the heaviest cut it's going to take is what it's taken off of those corners right there and it seemed to hold in those clamps so 
Take this last little bit here. The rest is all just punching some holes, so. One tool down. Drilled some holes, we bored the main pivot hole, and now it's going to get in there and cut those crescents. We're starting to cut those. Seems to be cutting pretty aggressive. Hopefully, that cutter holds up. There we go, cycle time 16 minutes, 19 seconds. Before to do one of these as an individual, what we saw up on the computer, that was five minutes and 22 seconds. So that's a little over 21 minutes. Actually, that was a correction. It's uh, if you look down here at the bottom, estimated cycle time was five minutes and 51 seconds. So that's almost 23 and a half minutes for four of them. Even better time savings than I thought on this. So that's like a five minute savings, six minute savings. That's somewhere around 25, 
50% time savings just in machining time alone, not to mention changeover. So that's the savings in machining time alone, not to mention taking it in and out of the vise, setting one up individually. And there we go. All right, let me get in there and do a little bit of measuring, but it sure looks good. It doesn't look like anything moved around on us. So let me go grab a bushing to drop in there and a 1 8 pin to drop in there. And uh, yeah, let's check out how we did. All right, well, our stop pin is a nice fit in there. The bushing is just nice. Push it down in there. So it's even in there that far and you still got to push it the rest of the way. So just a nice fit on that reamed hole. The 1 8 feels good. So I'll get out there and I'll measure a ball bearing over this reamed hole right here and then we should be good. So, you know, cut into my pallet. I wanted to go a little bit past on these spots right here. So cut some grooves in the pallet. That'll be fine for future. And uh, yeah, let me swap out these four, run the other eight. No sense in y'all watching that again. And then we'll come back and we will just put another pallet on here. Don't have to probe anything. We'll just set up that other pallet with the titanium plates, enter the program for that, and we'll start cutting on another pallet. I think this system is definitely some significant time savings. Pretty excited. We're definitely increasing production here now. All right, let me knock out the other eight on here. We'll come back and try something different. All right, there's eight of them complete in 28.5 minutes, 28.26. So nothing eventful, all went really, really smooth. So there's a whole pallet full of eight of them. And that is 14 minutes faster than the five minutes and 20 seconds times eight. That would be 42 and a half minutes. So 14 minutes faster, that is a full 33% savings in just machining time alone not to mention in and out of the vise and the setup on that. So, dang, I mean, almost 50% savings in time, plus this runs longer, I can get over in the shop and I can be doing and working on other things. This is awesome. All right, let's go ahead and clean up this one. Let's run one more of a different pallet before we wrap up this video. No probing, no anything. I'm just gonna make sure I've got the tool set up in here and we'll load some titanium blanks up in the other pallet and we'll get that one run. All right, well, there they are. There's the 12 of them and uh, ready for just some manual machining now. I'm gonna stack them all on this quarter inch dowel, keep them all lined up, and then I just quickly machine off the top, machine off a little bit off of the, the bottom, get the profile done, and then start doing some hand grinding on them. I'll show you what they look like stacked on this bolt. We'll get ready to do that manual machining and then we're gonna move on to this other pellet. Well, there we go. That pretty much looks like one right there all stacked together. Just slap those in the manual mill, skim a little off the top, a little off the bottom, profile the ends, we're ready to go. All right, let's get this other pallet set up. All right, we got the other pallet stored back in the drawer, got the name stamped on it. That's, on it. That's taken care of, let's get this one loaded up and in the machine. All right, we'll get that over in the machine before we get it torqued down. All right, I got a batch of new tools loaded in there. We are at G59.3, got the new file loaded in there. And even though we're doing a pattern, you can see that it still shows all six of them on there, even though it's that's what we programmed in Fusion. And this is the cascade of a pattern down here. Got our tools set up over on this side, shows us what we needed. And G59.3 should be looking good. Our pallets all loaded in there and torqued down. Let's go ahead and knock out six of these. That'll be three handles total. Program ran five minutes and 45 seconds on a single one in a vise. Gonna run a lot quicker. Although, since I changed the facing operation on the front end, not gonna save the same kind of time that we did last time, but it's only because I uh, ended up with a way better finish or 
hoping to end up with a lot better finish on these. So pretty good trade-off. All right, let's go ahead and hit go and see how she runs. All right, so I had to pause this after the first op this time around. Using that half inch end mill, such a better finish on these than I was getting with my three inch face mill on this titanium before. So I know it added considerable amount of time to this operation, but by far that'll be worth it. It'll save me that time and cleanup at the end before I go sandblast these. So that was a good trade off. And also, I mean, I'm only taking a three thou cut off of there and you can see all six of these pieces cleaned up even with that little three thou cut. In my next batch of material I ordered, I got extra thickness so that I'm not cutting it so close on my material. But for this first batch, I still have some more of this. I think this is pretty much the last of my uh, my stuff material that's this thickness. Pretty good, that pallet, I mean, we've got it all within three thou. Everything is definitely being held down where it's supposed to be. Looking good, we'll see how that does when I flip it over. So far, first step on this pallet, working great. Interesting how it pauses after the pattern before it moves on to the next one. Still, it is just cruising through all these holes. Such a cool operation to watch this instead of one of the time in the vice. we go 39 minutes 27 seconds like i say it took five minutes and 45 seconds to do these before that would be a total of like 46 47 minutes so we only saved about eight minutes or so machining time with this pallet 
But again, that's because I did a completely different operation for the facing. That's where almost all the time was added, but so worth it. That finish on there is so much better than what I was getting before. And there it is. There's another pallet done with this Pearson Pro Pallet system. I think we've got two pallets done, two pallets that we've tried making parts on, and the system is working. Just can't say enough positive about this thing. Pretty excited. So I'm going to go through and I need to run this same pallet. I need to run this four more times. I'll put some more blanks on there to get all 12 of these done. And then after that, I'm going to flip it over. I'll run the other op. I'll see how the day goes. I may go ahead and uh, add that to the video as well and just show this pallet running the, uh, the other operation on the other side real quick. And then we'll wrap up this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. I know uh, this whole pallet process has been a great learning experience for me. All right, so while the next batch of six of these is running, let's do a little quality check on here and see how we did. I ran these around and I deburred the edge a little bit so that when uh, I flip these over and put them back in the pallet, then uh, I know that they're going to, let's see, came out of there this way. So yeah, when I flip it back over, it's gonna go back in the, back in the pallet the other way. We're gonna use that exact same edge to line it back up in there to do the backside. So I deburred the face a little bit, deburred the edge, make sure that's gonna sit flat back in the pallet, and let's do some quick measuring. So these start out at about 0.195 thick. Let's see, exactly, maybe 196. They are gonna vary since every one of them is gonna be a little bit different. And we're down to 195-ish. Yeah, that one's a little below 195. So there's definitely some variability. Another reason why you want to make sure you order material a little thicker. I'm cutting it a little close. So we were supposed to take three off of one side, leave two for the other side. Let's see how we did. So we took, yeah, from 96 or about 93 there. So I've got about three thou to take off the other side. And a little bit of variation, again, depending on how they're sitting. So down to 90. So they may not quite clean up on this top side, but that's okay. The accuracy is for the inside where the blade runs. This is the contour on the outside. So um, I know some of them are gonna clean up on the outside, some will not. But overall, that looks pretty close. A little over 190 there. About 190 and a half, 191. So they're sitting pretty good in that pallet. Again, this is not perfectly flat material. This is totally unfinished, so they aren't all gonna sit exactly perfect in there. If they've got a high spot in the middle, it's gonna push them up on the edges, etc. We've got a flat surface now. When I flip it over, if it doesn't totally clean up, that's fine for this particular part. And like I said, I'm now starting with quarter inch thick material to make sure that I'm gonna have a good cut on each side to do that. So happy with that so far. Let's see how we did on our depth. That's supposed to be six thou deep for that washer recess there. Yeah, I'm getting right in there about six and a half. So I'm within half a thou of my depth on that one. So that is good. Let me find a bushing to drop in there. Check out that ream hole. Okay, we've got a nice fit on that. And it doesn't go through because I didn't want my reamer to punch through and hit that plate, so I didn't have that set up to go all the way through. It's gonna get counterboard from this side, and then we'll have the through clearance that we need on there. And for the one eight holes, so for these ones, I used to ream them. I found that that card by drill does well enough for me. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's a nice, it's a snug fit, but it definitely, it, just a little bit of friction through there, but it goes. And we seem to have a good match one side to the other. We find another one of those. Okay, we've got good alignment. So quality wise, I think our program is good. We've got the other one running. As soon as that's done, we'll flip these over and we'll check out our program for the back side of these. All right, we're gonna run 
done one more pallet for this video. So we've got the outside holes going, we've got the pallet set up in there, running that first facing operation where it's just taking a couple thou tickle off of there, and then it'll go through and punch all the rest of the holes. See how she does. All right, we're getting in there, cutting the one slot. decent feed rate on that this time around ramping in at 15 inches per minute and then 20 inches per minute around the perimeter once it gets to depth Cruising along, drilling those little 256 tap drill holes. Not even building up chips on there, so that's nice. The chip breaking is working, keeping them all clear. We're about done. Well, there it is, another pallet complete, 3136, as opposed to about the 35 minutes it would take to complete this, doing them one at a time. So not a huge time savings, but again, that's because I'm doing this extra facing. So I'm getting a way better product in still less time, not quite as much less as the other one, but still saving a ton of tool changes and saving a bunch of different setups in and out of the vise. And that gives me 31 minutes to walk around the shop and do some other things. I was expecting actually a little more of this unfinished shadow in a few places. So we'll measure and see exactly what the thickness is. The rest of them all cleaned up pretty much entirely. Just got a little shadow here, a little bit unfinished on this one, which again, I knew that was gonna happen based on the thickness of this material. We'll do better on the next time. Let's check a couple other things here real quick. We'll do better measurements once I get this out, but let's just check a couple things. All right, I tried to give a little more clearance in this slot right here. Last time that was a little snug. So yeah, that seems to slide in there nicely. So that's good. And then on this cover plate, let's make sure we've got a good fit there. Nice, yes. It's just dropping down there. Good on depth, just a tiny little bit sticks up. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. We seem to have good fit. Let me get these out of here. We'll get the next batch started. There's another pallet done. I think we can call it a wrap and we'll start wrapping up this video. Use this pallet for two different operations. Use another pallet. We're getting there. All right, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Well, YouTube, I think that's as good a place as any to wrap up this video. I know we went through a lot. We finished another pallet. We used a couple of different pallets and cut some different machining operations. So definitely got a lot done in here. We talked about stock placement and putting the stock around your part when you're making it in order to properly set those on the pallet, make sure you have your material offsets the right direction, make sure you have your piece sitting on the pallet at the right height up off of the, the pallet itself. So a lot of information in this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I think beyond anything else have proven that these pallets are truly a effective way to increase production. I think on average, I'm somewhere around 25 to 35% uh, time savings just on the machining with the pallet alone. And if you take into account the wear and tear on tool changes and how many tool changes we're reducing, the amount of time I'm saving by not having to probe, by not having to change parts in and out of the vise, I mean, it's pretty easy to see where you can get, you know, maybe upwards of 50 to 60% overall time saving on machining your parts if you're truly doing some production runs. So I think beyond a doubt we have proven, hey, this Pearson Pro Pallet system is pretty good. It's definitely gonna work for me. It has taken my CNC machining to a whole new level and also just my fusion, it's just a lot of learning in fusion. So really enjoyed it. I think I only have one video left in this whole Pearson Pro Pallet series. Uh, if you remember from the first one, in addition to using the pallets like we've done here, I also made a pallet that holds like a half inch topper, kind of a, a two-stage pallet, so to speak. And that's what I'm gonna use next in order to bolt these pieces down now that I've got holes in them. And then that's what I'm gonna finish with the contours and everything on there. So that next video should be a lot quicker than this one. We're just gonna 
put some holes in one of those half inch top plates and then we will use that to bolt these two and we'll go through and machine out the contours and finish out these uh, this particular part, these knife handle slabs. Beyond that, most of the other pallets I have plans to make right now are going to be very, very similar. I just have three different knife handle designs or knife blade designs that I need to make, but my overall concept of how I'm going to make the pallets and the steps I'm going to use to go through and machine my knives is going to be pretty similar. So not going to go ahead and do videos on those. It would just be a repeat of what we've gotten here. So hopefully you got some good learning. If you're thinking about a pallet system, hopefully this helped you out. If you're new to the channel, hope you enjoyed it. Would encourage you to get out there and check out the other videos on the channel around machining, welding, knife making, just everything going on here in the Blades to Be shop. And if you like this video, hey, drop a comment, drop a like on there. We'd love to hear from you. For those of you already subscribed to the channel, sure appreciate you coming back to watch these videos. For those of you checking it out, great time to hit that subscribe button. Until next time, I hope you're out in your own shop working on some projects of your own. I'm going to be here in the Blades to Be shop working on that next pallet working on these knives and getting ready for Blade Show Atlanta in June. So June 3rd through the 5th, I'll be there at Blade Show Atlanta. Would love for you to stop by the table and uh, come and say hello. Until then, y'all take care.